Better Life Media, America's leading source for life improvement, presents Les Brown. Step into your greatness. Thank you. Hello, how are you? How many of you have some major goals you'd like to achieve? Raise your hands, please. Very good. I know you do. <laughs> That's why you showed up. I like to ask people whether or not they have goals that they'd like to achieve, and, and hopefully they're goals that are really are worthy of your efforts and your talents. I want you to shake someone's hand right now on your right and left, look them in the eyes, and say, you have something special. many don't aim at all. So raise the bar on yourself and don't ask how you're, doing, how you're going to do it. I'll never forget when I decided that I wanted to become a motivational speaker. I saw the, the late Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and, and my heart said, I can do that. But my mind asked the question, how? And for over 14 years, for 14 years, I would go see Zig Ziglar and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Jim Rohn and different speakers, and I would be in the audience, and, and my heart would pounce and say, you can do that, you can do that, Les. And then when I would leave, I would be going to the parking lot, and my mind said, how are you going to do it? And I spent so many years trying to figure out how. I wasted 14 years. How many of you ever have procrastinated? Raise your hands, please. Yeah, see, so, so as you begin to think about your goals, the most important thing is, and write this down, commit yourself. See, once you commit yourself, the how will come. The way will come. Once you commit yourself, you will then figure it out. And if you're going in the wrong direction, all you have to do is turn around and go in the other direction. You will figure it out. You want to begin to just challenge yourself. You want to stretch yourself because you really don't know what you can't do. I never forget the first day that I met Mr. Washington. I, I was born in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City. I was born in an abandoned building on a floor with a twin brother. And when we were six weeks of age, we were adopted. And when I was in the fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. And I failed again when I was in the eighth grade. I don't have any college education, but because of my mother, and I feel like Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my mother. I saw a sign once that said that God took me from my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. So my first major goal was to buy my mother a home, to take care of my mother. And, and I did that, took care of her until she passed at 88. But I'll never forget when I met Mr. Washington, I was in a class waiting on another student, and, and he came in and he said, young man, go to the board and work this problem out for us. I said, oh, sir, I, I can't do that. He said, why? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, look at me. I said, yes, sir, go to the board and work the problem out anyhow. I said, sir, I, I can't do what you're asking me to do. He said, why? Sir, because I'm, I'm educable, mentally retarded, sir. And as the students erupted in laughter, he came from behind his desk, he looked at me and he said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. 
And that was a turning point in my life. On one hand, I was humiliated. But on the other hand, I was liberated. Because he looked at me with the eyes of Goethe who said, look at a man the way that he is. He only becomes worse. But look at him as if he were what he could be. Then he becomes what he should be. And so Mr. Washington, he challenged me. And I want to challenge you right now about raising your goals. And, and I want you to shake someone's hand on your right and left, look them in the eyes and say, stretch yourself. <laughs> yeah, see, see, I think that, that you really have to stretch yourself to discover your stuff. I think that we have to really begin to experiment with life. And I said that you have something special. I didn't say that just to be kind and courteous. You do. See, I think that there are not many people that come to seminars or workshops or will watch a program of this nature. Why? I just think that most people are just satisfied to where they are. I'm, I'm reminded of a man one day, he was walking down the street and he passed his porch where some people were on the porch talking and there was a dog moaning and groaning. And he was curious why the dog was moaning and groaning. And he, he went back and he said, um, excuse me, he asked the owner, why is the dog moaning and groaning? The guy said, because he's laying on a nail. He said, well, why won't he get off? He said, it's not hurting bad enough for him to get off. Just hurting bad enough to moan and groan. How many of you know people who should be here? Raise your hands, please. How many of you know people, all they do is moan and groan? <laughs> moan and groan. I, I, I'm not making enough money. Moan and groan. I, I'm, I'm unhappy with my job. 87% of people go to jobs that they hate. And in, in addition to that, you know, that, as we know, that, that we have the dubious distinction in this country that on, on Monday morning, the heart attack rate increases over 35%. On Monday morning, between 6 o'clock and 9, people going to jobs that they hate. The heart said, didn't I tell you I didn't want to go? And attack them. <laughs> Some of you don't want to go to work next Monday. <laughs> So the thing is this, so you want to find out what resonates with you. What is it you really want to do? You want to experiment with life and find out what fits for you. You have something special. You have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. See, I believe that anybody through observation and practice can perform at the level of excellence. But... When you're pursuing your greatness, and this is worth writing down, you don't know what your limits are, and you act like you don't have any. So I say to you, you have something special. You have greatness within you. And, and I want to make four things clear. Number one, everything that I'm going to say, you already know it. If what I share, the message that, that I'm going to express right now and share with you, if it wasn't a part of who you are already, you wouldn't be in the audience. That's number one. That's, not, that's very important. It's already in you. I'm going to only confirm and validate that which is a part of you anyhow. The second thing is everything I'm going to say to you, you've heard it before from people with college degrees and credentials I can't hold a candle to. It's common sense, but not common practice. Third thing is I don't want you to agree with me, and I don't want you to believe me. I just want you to be open to some things right now. I want you to think beyond that which is commonly allowed. And I'm going to tell you what I'm up to. I want you to think about your goals, and I want to tell you what I'm going to do right now. My whole goal is to get past your mind. That's my whole challenge, and there's nothing you can do about it. I'm going to do that. See, your assignment was to show up. My assignment is to get past your mind and get into your heart. Once you think about the goals that you want to achieve, and I really want to challenge you to make up your mind that you're going to make that happen for yourself. And I hope that it's some goal that, that really resonates with who you are. When I was a little boy, my goal was to, to just buy groceries for our family. My mother worked on Miami Beach. She was a domestic worker. And, and my goal was to, to really be able to go to the grocery store and purchase groceries ourselves. The families knew that my mother had adopted seven children. And so they said, Mamie, whatever food is left over after we eat, you can take that home to the children. They were very kind, very, very considerate people. The mother, my mother, who, when she worked on Miami Beach, the people were very kind. I was appreciative of their generosity. But as a little boy, I said, Mama, one day, when I become a big boy, I'm going to be able to buy groceries for us. My goal as a little boy was to buy clothes for my brothers and sisters. 
We wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that Mama babysat for when she went over in Miami Beach. And if the clothes were too small, she would let them out. And if they were too large, Mama could sew and take them up. And I'll never forget um, David Sadursky. His father was very wealthy. Mama worked for him. But David was my buddy. And so his father gave him two gifts for his birthday. Gave him uh, a, a brand new boat, but he also gave him some motivational tapes. Earl Nightingale. I'll, I'll never forget. So he said, David, man, let me tell you something. When, when I die, you, you're going to get everything. I want you to listen to these tapes. And, and when his father left the room, David threw those tapes in the wastebasket. I said, David, could I have those tapes? He said, yes. I said, man, your father said, if you listen to these, you, you can get more and do more than what he's done. He said, hey, look, I'm going to get everything anyhow. Go ahead, take them. <laughs> I thought I told my children, I'm not leaving them anything. You know, if I had a quarter and thought I was going to die, I'd swallow it. <laughs> Write this down. It's not what you leave for your children. It's what you leave in them. Not what you leave for them, what you leave in them. No, absolutely not. I'll tell you something else happened. I don't forget. Mama came home one day and said, Leslie, David sent you a new pair of shoes his father got for him. I said, oh, Mama, thank you so much. I can't wear David's shoes. I said, why? Well, you tell my buddy that, you know, I wear size nine and a half. He wears size nine. She said, boys, shut up, sit down and put those shoes on. She said, Marianne, go get some Vaseline. And she came in there, and my sister started rubbing the Vaseline over my feet. And she said, run some water in the bathtub. And she's not going there, and, and, and put your feet in those shoes, and don't mash the heel down. I said, Mama, don't, did, shut up, boy, don't mash the heel down. And then she had me to get in the bathtub. I said, Mama, these shoes hurt. She said, get in there and walk around in the water. And I'm walking around the bathtub. Then she tried to distract me. I knew what she was doing. How'd you do at school today? I did good. Did you get in any fights? No, ma'am. You know you fought somebody. Well, I only hit three people today. <laughs> and, and then after a while, she said, how are you doing? I said, well, they hurt. Do they hurt as bad as they were before? No, ma'am, they feel a little bit better. Keep on walking. Keep on walking. And then after a while, when the leather soaked up the water, the leather began to stretch to a perfect nine and a half. You think Fortune 500 companies started talking about doing more with less? My mother's been doing that for a long time. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do. But who would have thought, anybody looking in on this kid and these seven children, who would have thought? And I look at you and I say, you have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. No one could have convinced me that I would be doing what I'm doing right now. You know, the easiest thing I do every year is, is go into a sales organization and dramatically increase their sales or go into a prison and, and enable prisoners to see themselves differently and teach them the methods and techniques of how to plug into the system or motivate young people to begin to, to see how they can have a vision of themselves in the future and fit. That's the easiest thing I do, to, or train a speaker to help them to leverage their experience as a speaker and say, look, speaking is a projection of who you are, not who you think you ought to be, and come with power from a platform. That's the easiest thing I've ever done. Let me share with you the most difficult thing I've ever done. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do what I'm now doing. No one could have convinced me, just given my circumstances. I earn millions of dollars every year. No one could have convinced me. If, if both my parents came up here right now, I, I would not know either one. No one could have convinced me, being labeled educable, mentally retarded, born in an abandoned building of floor in Liberty City, poor section of Miami, Florida, failing twice in school, no college training, never worked for a major corporation. I did not know. I can do what I'm doing right now. I'll never forget Mike Williams, my mentor. One, I think a lot of people fail in life because of the fact that they need some mentoring. They need some coaching. Uh, repeat out to me, please. You need, you need see. some coaching. Oh. Yeah, see, 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 you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. I remember Mike saying, Les, you can do this. Mike, huh? Mike, how, man? Wait a minute, Mike. Uh, how, much, how much am I going to be able to... To, to, to charge, Mike, less, um, you, you, well, you could start out at $1,000 an hour. I thought, Mike, I don't make that working for two weeks. Come on, Mike. I, Mike, 
Man, I, I appreciate your belief in me, Mike. Look, Mike, I work for the Miami Sanitation Department. Man, I've, I've been a garbage collector. Uh, uh, you know, I've, you know I've, I've done door-to-door sales. That, that was great. And, you know, I, I'm here as a disc jockey. That's good, Mike. But, Mike, I, I don't think I can do that less. You can. But Mike, I don't have any credentials. I've never, I've never written any book, anything. Man, I'm, I'm not rich. How can I teach somebody to do something I've never done? But Les, why don't you just test yourself? Why don't you stretch, Les? Come on, man. Mike, I, I don't know. And here's something I, I realized. Write this out. Sometimes you have to believe in somebody's belief in you until your belief kicks in. I respect Mike Williams. Here, this young man, he, he saw something in me that I didn't see it in a strong analytical mind. And I looked at him. I always respected his thinking. And he looked at me, and he made me feel special. And I said, OK, Mike. And I just kept holding on to what Mike said to me. I just kept holding on to what Mr. Washington said to me. I kept holding on to my mother saying, you're special, Leslie, when they said you're educable, mentally retarded. Mama didn't know what that meant. She only had a third grade education. So she said, he'll be all right, honey, hard head, make a soft behind. He'll be fine. <laughs> but she said, you're special, baby. You are special. And, and they kept saying that over and over again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. And so here's what I want you to do. Let us say together, as you think about your goals and your dream, let us say together, it's possible together, please. It's possible. Say it like you mean it. It's possible. Thank you. Write that down. See, see, most people never achieve their goals because most people suffer from possibility blindness. They look, about, they look around trying to think about the things that they don't have. Robert Roots, young man who wrote a book about <laughs> success principles of the three little pigs, he said, it's not what you don't have, it's what you think you need that keeps you from being successful or happy in life. It's not what you don't have. See, I was focused on what I didn't have. Don't have a college degree, don't have any credentials, never worked for a major corporation. I was focused on the negative things. I said, negative things are the things that you see when you're not focused on your goal. What do you come with? What is it that you have within you that you showed up to bring? Hey, Les, you don't know, but my, my dream is a long shot, long shot. A friend of mine, Dexter Yeager, said, when the dream is big enough, the odds don't matter. I'm reminded of a great man when I was reading Time magazine talking about some of the great minds of the last century. They, they didn't mention his name, Dr. Howard Thurman, one of the mentors of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and also an advisor to Mahatma Gandhi and, and Albert Schweitzer. And he said, the ideal situation for a man or woman to die is to have family members standing around their bed praying with them as they cross over. But imagine, if you will, being on your deathbed and standing around your bed, the dreams given to you by life, the ideas that you never acted on, the talents, the gifts, the abilities that you never used. And there they are, standing around your bed, looking at you with large, angry eyes, saying, we came to you, and only you could have given us life. And now we must die with you forever. And the question is, if you died this very moment, what will die with you? What dreams, what ideas, what talents, what leadership potential, what greatness that you showed up to bring, that you allowed fear of procrastination to hold you back? Perhaps that's why Henry David Thoreau wrote the words, Oh God, to reach the point of death, only to realize that you've never lived, only to realize that you've never scraped the surface of your potential. Repeat after me, please, with power, feeling, and conviction. I refuse, I refuse. to die, die. and unlive life. life. Yes, shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, Live your dream. Yeah, I think we should all resolve. I refuse to die an unlived life. Don't worry about the odds. You survived one out of 40 million sperms. You will never have those odds again. You beat those odds, you can win anything. 
here's something else stop most people. You know what it is? Failure. Let us say together, I will fail my way to success. Yes, write that down. I will fail my way to success. See, eight out of 10 millionaires have been financially bankrupt. 85% of people allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. And I believe that the reason that most people um, go so far in life and stop, Maya Angelou said it best. She, she wrote a poem. She said that most people go so far in life and then they park. They pull off the highway of life. Especially when they get some hits, especially when they've been rejected, especially if they have an illness, especially if they lose something, they, they park. And, and I take it further. They don't even turn on their emergency lights. It's not because uh, that, that they are broken down. They don't want anybody to stop and say, hey, look here, I've got some jumping cables in my trunk. You need, you need a jump? Hey, look here. There's a service station ahead about three or four miles. I have a can. I can take you up there and get some gasoline. Oh, no. I'm just fine. I, I had a talk show once, and highest rated, fastest canceled talk show in the history of television. <laughs> well, at least I had one. <laughs> and, and I was excited. You know, when the time I came into television um, years ago, it, television was based upon conflict and controversy. So I said, I want a solution-oriented talk show. First concept of that kind. High ratings. And the syndicators say, you just got lucky. Come on, let's do these other type of shows. You can be a, a Jerry Springer. Oh, no, that's not why I came here. No, I, I, I believe that we live in the greatest country in the world where we should hold ourselves to certain standards. I, I'm not going to come here and sell out on who I am. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to lower my standards for you. No, that's not why I showed up. And so they fired me. <laughs> Security walked him out. I said, I can walk by myself. <laughs> But let me tell you what happened. I took a hit, and I parked. It wasn't that I didn't have the ability to do more. I, my concept was good. But what happened when I took the hit, when they canceled the show, I canceled myself. When they said the show is going to be taken off television, it won't work, I told myself, Les, you can't succeed in television. And I parked. You know what I did? I went back to my comfort zone as a motivational speaker. At least I, I, I'm doing better than most people. That's nothing to compare yourself to the worst that other people are doing and then make yourself feel better. No, I parked. I didn't have my emergency lights on. I didn't want to show up on the radar. I parked. You know how long I parked? I parked for 10 years. Do you hear me? Now, unlike Regis Philbin, when his shows were canceled, he kept going, he kept going, he kept going, and he got other shows. I bet you somebody gave him a push. Somebody said, hey, you need a lift. I didn't even make that an option for me. I got off the highway, I went to back to my comfort zone, and I parked. The show failed, and I identified myself as a failure. And guess something happened. One day, just flipping the channels, looking at PBS, and saw Wayne Dyer, my friend Wayne Dyer. And boy, I said, wait. We're both in our 60s. Wayne is still doing it. Wow, the little hair he has, it's gray. He's still there. <laughs> I said, hey, I've got some more stuff in me. I've got another PBS special in me. I've got, I've got some other ideas. You know, Oprah and Phil, they're doing my stuff. Maybe I need to come back out here. And I, and I went back and started calling PBS and, and different people. They said, Les, what happened to you? I said, well, um, I didn't know whether or not anybody would be interested in me because the show was canceled. No, no, you had some good ideas. And when they said, yeah, we would love to do a show with you. I said, you what? They said, yes. And when I went into the studio and, and people that worked with 10 years ago, they were still there. And I said, guys, you know, do you guys still have it? They said, we have it. Do you have it? I said, I think so. You know. And I did the show, and I wasn't as good as I was 10 years ago because I was off the highway. I'd gotten off the highway of life. I, I'd been parked for so long, it's taken me some time to get my strength back, to find my power, to get my confidence back. But at least I'm back out there in the game, determined to dry empty. So I say to you, see, I only attract millionaires of millionaires in training. He's going to get that in a minute. You have something special. You have greatness within you. 
And the only reason you are here, you are my assignment. You can feel me. Some of you feel me right here in your heart of heart. And my goal in, is to get past your mind and into your heart. So it's necessary that you, you have the mindset that I can do this. You've got to begin to believe and to fortify that belief and feed that belief by listening to tapes, going to seminars and workshops, by challenging yourself, by stretching yourself. It was Osborne who said, unless you attempt to do something beyond that, which you've already mastered, you will never grow. And, and as you begin to challenge yourself, you'll discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. The other thing is you begin to look at yourself, look at your dreams, and, and, and begin, begin to experiment and stepping into your greatness. One of the things that's very important, whatever goals and dreams that you have, repeat after me, please. Make your move before you're ready. You have Price Pritchett, who's a great, great motivator and, and, and trainer. He said, make your move before you're ready. We're in, instructed in, in life to walk by faith and not by sight. See, you want to really begin to stretch yourself. You want to become a risk taker. You want to raise the bar on yourself. Most people won't do that. See, most people engage in low-life living, low-risk living. This God said, if you're not willing to risk, you cannot grow. And if you cannot grow, you cannot become your best. And if you cannot become your best, you can't be happy. And if you can't be happy, then what else is there? I like what Helen Keller said, life is short and unpredictable. Eat the dessert first. <laughs> and so... You want to begin to take some chances. You want to begin to challenge yourself and make it okay to fail and learn from your failures. Don't allow fear of failure and the, the, the allure, the attractiveness of playing it safe in life to draw you in. You can't get out of life alive. You've got to die to leave here. Other thing is you look at yourself and look at your dreams. Detoxify your life. Write that down. See, I think that most people never achieve their true goals in life because they're surrounded with too many toxic, negative, energy-draining people. You've got to look at the people in your life and ask yourself the question, what is this relationship doing to me? How is it impacting my life? Am I a better person? Sidney Portier wrote a book called The Measure of a Man. And it, it, it's powerful, but I encourage you to get the tapes. I love his voice. And, and he said something in there. He said, when you go for a walk with someone, something happens unconsciously. It's not spoken. Either you adjust to their pace or they adjust to your pace. Whose pace have you adjusted to? See, you want to surround yourself. My, my daughter, Ona Brown, who's a speaker and coach, she says, call forth your team, but make sure these are people that you can learn from. i never forget, I'm on a special board with a, a Bishop T.D. Jakes, and we went into a board meeting. He looked at everybody before opening the meeting. He said, as soon as I know as much as you do, you're fired. And with that, the meeting is now open. Everybody continued to learn on that boy. <laughs> Trust me on that. A friend of mine, Dennis Kimbrough, a motivational speaker out of Atlanta, he said, if you're the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. So as you look at yourself and look into the future, call forth your team. Uh, George Frazier says, your network determines your net worth. Who do you allow to be in your ear? What kind of relationships are you developing? Are they an asset to you or they are a liability? Do they elevate your spirits or do they tear you down? They get two types of people, nourishing people and toxic people. Nourishing people, they bring the best out of you. They encourage you, they inspire you, they hold you accountable. Toxic people, they are critical people, always telling you what you can't do. They're always measuring your possibilities based upon their failures. My mother said, never let anybody tell you what you can't do, son, especially if they haven't done it. They don't know what's possible for you. So as you begin to look at yourself, begin to identify the relationships that you communicate with most and say, hey, is this relationship helpful to me? And then think about some people that you need to bring into your life, that you can learn from, that you can grow from. I joined the National Speakers Association when I decided that I wanted to speak. I wanted to, to be around the people that were doing what I wanted to do. I'll never forget what I saw Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. He said, you. You have something special. You have greatness within you. And you can do more than you can ever begin to imagine. And 
here I am. And the audience said, oh my goodness. I'd read the power of positive thinking 17 times. My hero. And I saw him backstage and I said, Dr. Peel, hi, my name is Les Brown. I've listened to your tapes and I've read your books. They gave them to us in special education, sir. And one day I would love to be on stage with you. And he looked at me and said, it's possible, young man. It's possible. But this man, when he spoke, he gave me goose pimples, deep baritone voice, dope spoke from his diaphragm. You have something special. You have greatness within you. He overrides the inner conversations in my mind. I, I'll never forget um, a, a gentleman, what a brilliant man, a Harvard graduate, um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. He said, if you can determine what a man shall think, you never have to concern yourself with what he will do. If you can make a man feel inferior, you never have to compel him to seek an inferior status, for he will seek it himself. And if you can make a man feel justly an outcast, never have to order him to go to the back door, he'll go without being told. And if there's no door, his very nature will demand one. See, we live in a world where we're told more about our limitations rather than our potential. How many of you have ever been told that you couldn't do something? Raise your hands, please. You know, MIT did a study that if I say to you, you can't do that, that 16 people have to come along and say, you can do that, you can do that, you can do that, to neutralize that, and the 17th statement that you hear, you can do it, will be the one that will finally stick. So you have to watch who's speaking into you. You've got to begin to monitor your mind. And, and you've got to begin to literally be proactive in programming yourself to success. Be ye not conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got to take responsibility to make that happen. And as you begin to do that, you'll begin to see some incredible changes in your life. I understand now when Earl Nightingale said, all of us are self-made, but only the successful will admit it. As you begin to look at your dreams and look at your goals, write this down. Make no your vitamin. See, most people stop short of their dreams and park and get off the highway of life because of the rejections of life. You will always be rejected. It's no big deal. Jack Canfield said rejection is a myth. It's not like when somebody says no and then they slap you. No, it's just, you know, to me, make no your vitamin. Get excited about the no. Why? Because every time someone says no, that brings you another step to a yes. You're getting closer. Trust me, you will win if you don't quit. You will win if you don't quit. Even a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> the other thing is, that as you look at yourself and look at your goals and look at your dreams, assess yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What do you bring to the table? When I looked at becoming a motivational speaker, I looked at all the speakers and I noticed that they were pretty much scripted. So I said, what is it that can make me stand out? I don't have any college education. Um, I don't have any credentials. I never worked for a major corporation. What is it I can do to offset my weaknesses? And then something said, well, Les, and this is very important. Mr. Washington, Mr. Brown, yes, sir, what do you want to do with your life? I want to become successful. Good. He said, you must be willing to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. That's why you said you have something special. See, very few people go to seminars and workshops. They'll go to a concert, but showing up to get something that can expand their minds and help them to begin to see their lives differently, to give them a larger vision of themselves, they'll be too busy. Or they say, well, how much does it cost? Well, information costs, but it pays for itself. Here's the other thing is, ladies and gentlemen, let's say it's me. Yeah, see, it's, it's possible you can live your dream. It's necessary that you have the mindset that, that I'm going to do this. But you've got to take ownership. You've got to decide, hey, I'm going to do this. You're going to, you've got to take responsibility for your life. George Bernard Shaw said the people that make it in this life, they look around for the circumstances that they want, and if they can't find them, they create them. You've got to decide, it's me. You've got to say, and say this with, with conviction, I expect to win. Yes, I think it's important that we say that. You know, if you ask most people, do you want to become successful? They will say yes. Took my oldest son for a walk, my namesake. You know, we always expect our children to do far more than what we do. Said Calvin, he wants his own identity. He's Leslie Calvin Brown, Jr. I stopped him, looked him in the eyes. I said, do you want to be successful, son? He said, yes, sir, dad. Very good. Let's walk, son. Walk further. Stopped him again. 
I said, Calvin, look me in the eye, son. Yes, sir, Dad. Do you expect to be successful, son? And he stood there and he looked at me and his eyes got glassy. And he said, let's walk. And the reason that he said, let's walk, because my son is very bright. Of all my children, he's perhaps the smartest one. But Calvin now, over 30, Calvin now, a single parent of two daughters, good father. Calvin, now at this stage of his life, he's behind on his dreams. A lot of talent, a lot of abilities. Very conservative. One of those people, great mind, but just, he just hasn't developed that, oh, you know, things that we want our kids to have that, I want it. Calvin, Calvin, you got to kick it up a notch, son. You never thought you'd be in your 30s. You got to kick it up a notch. You got to increase your energy in order to, to live your dreams. You can't be casual about your dreams. Bill Bailey said, if you're casual about your dream, you'll end up a casualty. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, kick it up a notch. <laughs> yes. Yes. You've got to kick it up a notch. What is it you bring? And whatever you bring, you've got to kick it up a notch. What is your signature as you look at where you want to go and what it is you want to do? As you look at your product or your services, repeat out to me, please, provide more service than you get paid for. Yeah, see, that becomes your signature. When you look at your goals and look at where you want to go, at your products, at your services, at your industry, you want to set some high standards for yourself. I like what Henry David Thoreau said, do not go where the path may lead, but go where there's no path and leave a trail. How is it that your industry will be done differently five years from now, ten years from now? What is your reputation in your industry? When you come into a room and you leave, what's the scuttlebutt about you? Do people say, hey... That's a go-to person. That's a person, if you ask them to do that job, you're talking about the job being done. It will be done extremely well. Are you known for that person that, that stand out with what you do, that stand out with your quality of service, with your standards, always looking for ways to better your best? Are you one of those people that believe, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Japanese believe it ain't perfect. Keep working on it. Are you willing to keep working on it? Are you, willing, are you willing to realize that you have not done your best stuff yet, that you can better your best? You've got to take responsibility for that. And now let's go to the next level. Not only is it possible that you can live your dream, is it necessary that you call forth your team and surround yourself with people that you can learn from and grow from, that you must work on yourself and monitor yourself and, and train yourself? that you've got to begin to take total responsibility for the outcomes that you want to produce in your life. But let us say together with power and conviction, it's hard. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, living a dream, changing your life, it's hard. It's hard when you lose all your money, when you, you, you've given it the best that you have, when you have some major setback, it's hard. When a doctor looked at me and said the three horrible words no one wants to hear, you have cancer. It was hard to mobilize my mind and spirit, to listen to tapes and music and read scripture and be around other people and seeking out other prostate cancer conquerors to believe that I could do this. It was hard. Never forget my son said, Daddy, are you going to die? Why are you asking me that? You're not going out much. You're not the bubbly personality that I know you to be. You're not talking much. You're spending a lot of time in the room by yourself, Dad. Are you going to surrender? Are you giving up? Are you going to let that, that doctor's opinion become your reality? Will my daddy see me graduate? Yes, yes, son, yes, yes. I'm going to fight. No, no, I, I don't think it's my time yet. I'm going to see you graduate, but more than that, I've got some other things that I'm going to do with my life. And I thank you for asking me that. Um, but I must tell you that I'm scared. I'm scared. And um, I've never been in this situation before. It's, it's been easy for me to talk to people and encourage people when they've had challenges in their lives. Um, but it's me. And I don't feel less than a man in, let, in, in, in admitting this to you. Yes, I'm scared. And... I need some help. Repeat after me, please. Ask for help. Ask for help. Not because you're weak, 
but because you want to remain strong. And ask for help. And don't stop until you get it. Yes. See, see, life is hard. And, and there are some moments in life when you're going to need some help. You're going to need somebody to speak to you. You're going to need somebody to say something to you. I have a friend of mine, Willie Jolly, who's a motivational speaker. He said, a setback is a setup for a comeback. I had to listen to Willie's tapes. I have another friend, Kevin Brace, who's a, who's a speaker. He said, Les, come on, man. You can do this. You can make this happen. You can hit a home run. It's a done deal. You are Les Brown. That cancer's got to get out of your body. I said, talk to me, Kevin. Talk to me. That's what I need to hear. I needed to hear those words. I don't care who you are. Many people won't allow themselves to ask for help because of, of pride. Pride cometh before fall. Because of ego. Ego means edging God out. No, ask for help. Not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong. And ask for help and don't stop until you get it. I'm here because a lot of people helped me. I'm here because a lot of people believed in me at a time when I was struggling to believe in myself. The other thing is, let us say together, it's worth it. Yeah, see, I think, and write this down, you've got to find five reasons that will make it worth it for you. Five reasons. What will make it worth it for you? Mine was, I want to take care of my mother. Mine was, I want to do something with my life. What will make it worth it for you? Mine is, I want to leave a legacy. Mine is, I refuse to die an unlived life. What will make it worth it for you? Repeat out to me, please. You've got to be hungry. Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, what do you want to do with your life, sir? I, I want to become a disc jockey. Is that right? Yes, sir. Good. Mr. Brown, you've got to be hungry. He said, I want you to listen to Paul Harvey. He's the world's greatest communicator. Always find a coach or mentor, someone that's doing what it is you want to do. Watch them. Listen to how he does the rest of the story. Listen to his voice, Mr. Brown. Develop your mind and develop your communication skills because once you open your mouth, young man, you tell the world who you are. And don't forget, Mr. Brown, you've got to be hungry. Take the time to develop yourself. So I started training and working on myself. And then pretty soon I came to him. I said, sir... I've been working on myself. I, I've done the things that you told me to do. I listened to Earl Nightingale all the time and Zig, and, and I've been reading Dr. Norman Vincent Peale's book, and, and I'm ready. I, I practice every day two and three hours, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. Very good, Mr. Brown. You've got to be hungry. I said, why do you continue to say that? Sir, you, people that are hungry are unstoppable, Mr. Brown. People that are hungry, no excuse is acceptable. Go out and face the music, young man, and don't forget, stay hungry. And make no your vitamin. I went to apply for a job on Miami Beach. Milton Butterball Smith was the program director. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. He said, young man, you have any journalism in your background? No, sir, I don't. You have any experience in broadcasting? No, sir, I don't. He said, I'm sorry, we don't have any job for you. I went back and I, I told Mr. Washington. I was devastated. I said, Mr. Washington. They said, no, they wouldn't even allow me to, to audition for them, sir. Mr. Brown, don't take it personally. I told you, make no your vitamin. Most people are so negative, they have to say no seven times before they say yes. Be unstoppable, Mr. Brown. you got to be hungry. Go back again. Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. Young man, weren't you here yesterday? Yes, sir, I was. Didn't I tell you no yesterday? Yes, sir, you did. Then why are you back today? Well, sir, I didn't know that whether or not somebody was laid off or somebody was fired, sir. Nobody was laid off or fired. Now, get on out of here. I came back the next day. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. I know what your name is. Weren't you here the last two days? Yes, sir, I was. Didn't I tell you no the last two days? Yes, sir, you did. Then why are you back today? Well, sir, I didn't know whether or not someone got sick or someone died, sir. No one got sick or died. No one was laid off or fired. Now, don't you come back here again. I came back the next day talking loud, looking happy like I see you for the first time. Hello, Mr. Vanderval. How are you? He looked at me with rage. He said, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> so I became the errand boy for the disc jockeys. I'd go get their lunch and their dinner, and I'd stand in the control room memorizing their hand movements on the control board and all the instruments, learning everything that I could because I expected to be, high, to be behind that microphone. Then one day, it was a Saturday afternoon,
and a disc jockey by the name of Rockin' Roger was drinking while he was on the air. Rockin' Roger got so drunk, he started slurring his words. He was about to fall off the chair. He obviously could not complete his program. And there I was, looking at him through the control room window. A Saturday afternoon, I was the only one there, young, ready, and hungry. <laughs> Walking back and forth saying, drink, rock, drink. <laughs> drink, rock. I'd have gone and get him some more if he'd asked me to. <laughs> then pretty soon the phone rang. It was the general manager, and I answered the phone. I said, hello. He said, young boy, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now, you must be think I'm crazy. <laughs> I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra, and said, you all come out on the front porch and turn up the radio? I'm about to come on air. <laughs> I waited for about 20 minutes, and I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go on there and segue the records, but don't say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I could wait to get old Rock out of the way. I put on a fast record. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P, Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bona fide, doubly qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. The people that want to step into their greatness are hungry. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, you got to be hungry. <laughs> what is your legacy? What will your statement be? Resolve every day. Read it every day. I refuse to die and unlive life. I like to leave this with you that mama used to love to hear me say. She said, boy, say that thing for me, and I dedicate this to you, to the greatness that's within you, because it's there. And it says simply this, if you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and sleep for it. If all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless and worthless without it, and if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it, and lose all your terror of the opposition for it, and if you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope, and confidence, and stern pertinacity, if neither cold poverty, famish or gold, sickness or pain of body and brain can keep you away from the thing that you want, if dogged and grim you besiege and beset it, with the help of God you'll get it. This has been Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. God bless you and God bless America. You have greatness in you. We hope you've enjoyed this special presentation of Les Brown's Step Into Your Greatness. If you would like to own a copy of this program or any of Better Life Media's programs, please visit our website at betterlifemedia.com where you'll find all types of valuable life improvement information.